mute everyone and we're going to get started. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay, so today's lecture is a second part to two lectures about surrealism and photography. And I think that what, what, what I would try to show you today is that surrealism is alive and well in the medium of photography. At the same time, many folks, when you think of surrealism in art, you rarely think about photography. You think of Dalí's paintings or Magritte's or maybe some sculptures by Giacometti. So this is gonna be a really quick tour of a lot of the surrealist photographers, starting with those, you know, formerly in the movement in the 1920s and 30s in France, but then expanding beyond that to other parts of Europe and then to the Americas and beyond. I'm really just concerned that you can hear me and I, I'm, Can someone just send me in the chat a quick, yes, we could hear you. Um, we hear you, Efren, no problem. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so, God, it's the worst start I've had in 10 sessions. Here we go. I wanted to put surrealism in context for you. I think that's important. Um, you know, when you study um, uh, a master's program like I did in modern and contemporary art, you usually start back in, in, around the 1850s, 1860s. So I just wanna clarify that by the time surrealism arrives, there's obviously been a number of movements that have already kind of questioned what beauty is, questioned what art is, brought in all kinds of new modes of art, whether it's impressionism, post-impressionism, eventually cubism, abstract art. And just to put it in perspective, surrealism, it's important to note, came right after Dada. Now the difference is Dada was a very specific movement from around the time of World War I. And it was actually a movement that was largely political and in response to the horrors of World War I. And so they do share some commonalities in the sense that you might see art that looks <clears throat> quite provocative, quite strange, kind of bizarre. But the thing is surrealism, as we'll speak about, is really about looking at the teachings of Freud, and going towards the idea that there's another reality than that that we see in front of us. And I think that this is important to acknowledge as well is that the surrealists in France and elsewhere at the time were working right on the kind of in between the two wars. And a lot of the artists that we'll talk about were very much anti-fascists and were starting to face the potential dangers of the Nazis coming. Some of them eventually, of course, had to leave. The other point about this slide is just to say that while Dada is largely a movement that, you know, went on and, you know, you don't really talk too much about Dada today. You could, but it's, it's not as alive and well. Surrealism really, even though it's considered to have the formal movement ended with Breton's death in 66, but I'll show you that artists are working in surrealist mode uh, very much so around the world. I won't go into this much. This is more of a review of last time. The formal leader and founder of uh, the, the movement was André Breton. This is his manifesto. And again, this was about the idea that, you know, Freud had revealed there's probably another reality that is in our subconscious and frankly, in our dreams, we see these highly symbolic um, objects, happenings, people, and those are probably wishes and desires in disguise. And the art we're gonna create in surrealism is not gonna look at you know, regular norms of aesthetics or regular norms of reason. It's gonna just kind of go inside and, and try to reflect that other reality. So some of the things that I think you know you often see in surrealistic art might be dreamlike scenes like Magritte's train coming out of a fireplace. It might be, you know, bizarre assemblages like Oppenheim's famous cup covered in fur or a sculpture like Giacometti's, which is this kind of biomorphic figure. And what we mean by biomorphic is that 
it might be alive, it might not. It's just some kind of strange creature that looks like it might have life. So let's get to photography because in a way, photography was lagging in terms of being really avant-garde. If you look at the photography of the late 19th century and early 20th century, often it was photography that, you know, while trying to elevate the medium with the pictorialist to something very gorgeous, it was largely about what we call indexical truth. What you were seeing was true. You were seeing a beautiful portrait. Um, you were seeing the Flatiron Building by Steichen, but, but it was an actual building. It wasn't some alternate reality. Uh, or you might have seen the work of Lewis Hine and he was documenting the plight of immigrants in New York, but it was all very real. When Man Ray arrived, and we talked about this last time, you started seeing truly photography that was starting to look kind of an, alter an alternate reality. And when he published this book of what he called the delicious fields, Les Champs Delicieux, these were his rayographs. They were using a very innovative process that frankly had been used way, way back in the 19th century, but he was placing these objects on light sensitive surfaces and creating these really bizarre, really fun kind of alternative realities and quite abstract. The other thing he did, as we know, is he took someone like a muse, like Kiki de Montparnasse and create this wonderful kind of woman violin that he called uh, Le Violon d'Angre, which is also a, a, a pun because usually that's a way of calling something or someone a hobby. So it was his way of almost saying, Kiki is not only my muse, she's also my hobby. Um, and, and so this idea of starting to juxtapose objects and people and create strange, bizarre, different realities. And the last thing I'll say about Man Ray is you'll remember that he, um, he and Lee Miller started this whole process of solarization. So in the dark room, usually the last thing you want is light. And by accident, when Lee Miller turned the lights on, apparently because a mouse might have been in the, room, in the dark room, they discovered this very interesting kind of halo and glow that the prints were getting by solarizing them. So that's just to say that the reason Man Ray is often thought of as being kind of the first or most groundbreaking photographer of surrealism is because he was really giving us these images that were really different using unique processes. So now let's start talking about people near or around Man Ray in France that were also working in a very surrealistic fashion. Some of you may know the name Dora Marr. We're gonna, I'm gonna remind you who she was and she hasn't met Picasso in this photograph yet. Look at what she does. She uh, creates this fantastic dreamlike image of a hand coming out of a shell. You know, instead of being a crab, it's a hand. We don't know if it's coming out or retreating and she is on the sand and then there's this kind of really um, menacing sky above with clouds. So again, this is incredibly dreamlike. She's constructed this by this, again, this juxtaposition of, of strange, you know, why would a hand be coming out of here? And um, this, by the way, you will see is part of surrealism. Some of these parts of the body um, have particular fetishistic meanings. The hand is often sexual. It's often what's used to masturbate or give pleasure. So surrealism has a lot of symbolism, a lot of what might this mean if you saw it in your head? Is there sexuality here? And is there something grotesque as well? She was actually a commercial photographer and I, I thought I would share with you this wonderful advertisement she did for um, some hair oil products. Um, what's wonderful is even though it's an advertisement, you can see the surrealistic stint here. She's taken the bottle of oil and when it pours out, instead of what comes out is not the oil, but it's this fabulous flowing hair. 
And if you think about that, that's something we're gonna see a lot. You see just the hand by itself or you see hair in the absence of a woman. So you have what we call dislocation. In, in surrealism, it's about objects being dislocated from where they belong. Very often it will be an eye, a hand, um, hair. Um, and by the way, hair has all kinds of meaning in surrealism when it's long and flowing it's women's power or sexuality. When it's completely gone, it's loss or punishment. So here's another example of Adora Mars work. Um, this is using photo montage. We'll see a lot of that. It's a process by which, you know, you combine images from different negatives. And so you've got this fabulous, again, dislocated legs. It looks like she's holding them right above the river. This became an image that she had introduced to the International Surrealist, Surrealism Exhibition in London. And it became so popular with surrealists that they even had postcards they gave out. It's disturbing. People had no idea what it was. Uh, it's kind of gross. By the way, I want to warn you, you're going to see a good amount of gross stuff because I've, as you know, dreams can be nightmares. So um, this, uh, she never explained what it was, but every expert says that it's probably the fetus of an armadillo, but she calls it portrait of Ubu, which is a reference to a very controversial play from the 19th century called Ubu Goa that had a protagonist that was kind of this selfish, outrageous glutton and, uh, and, and, and kind of a horrible person. And here's this kind of as a sit-in for the protagonist. And now I'll remind you why you know the name Dora Mar is because she met Picasso in 1936. They were together for nine years. And here she shows us a very surreal image because it's Picasso, but holding this bull skull over his head. And again, uh, he used her in, you know, he portrayed her in tons of images. Usually he said this, this woman's always crying. She's dramatic. So she, you often made her the weeping woman. And the last thing I'll say about Dora Mar is that she famously is the photographer that um, showed Picasso's work on Guernica during all of the stages of its development, which of course you can now see at the Reina Sofia in Madrid. Let's talk about Lee Miller. And by the way, a lot of ladies and women, because it is Women's History Month, so I made sure that we had plenty of women photographers. Lee Miller was this gorgeous woman from New York it's, it's a really funny story. She, Conde Nast himself, saved her from being run down by a truck and discovered her as a model. There she is in the cover of Vogue. You may remember that in 1929, she went to Paris and wound up with Man Ray. So the reason I wanted to just remind you who she is, is we saw images last week. This was this really wildly surrealistic image of what Man Ray called the prayer, but which also kind of, again, dislocates the hands, the feet and the buttocks in a way that's very strange. It also suggests submission. And then you may remember that when she left him in 32, he put Lee Miller's eye on his metronome and call that object to be destroyed. But let's look at Lee Miller's work because she wound up being an, an artist, not only then, but for many, many years to come. Um, and one of the things about Lee Miller is she's not um, using things like photo montage or creating scenes. What she's doing is she's looking at nature and bumping into things and cropping them and lighting them in such a way that she really finds surrealism in nature. So here she is, they believe it's probably at a market where they're selling animals, including rats. But look at the lighting and the vantage point she chooses. And it creates this really eerie, strange image. Years later in Egypt, she's sitting inside of a tent. And look at this strange, it's almost like she finds the surreal just sitting there because you've got this 
and she calls it portrait of space. It's almost like, it's not a portrait of anyone. It's just a portrait of the fact that you almost forget what's in and what's out. And there's a frame and then there's another frame and then this mosquito net is open. And so it almost, it's about again, this idea of what do we see outside and what is inside. And I actually thought this comparison is really interesting because Marguerite had created a painting that was all about that. You know, it, the eye is, is the way we see what's out there. And yet there's probably a reality inside of us that's not what people see. These are really interesting. And again, speak to Lee Miller's ability to find surrealism outside. This is an entirely destroyed typewriter. And I initially thought, wow, I wonder if she took a hammer just like with the object to be destroyed that uh, Man Ray had made and, and, and broke it to be interesting. No, this is the London Blitz. And what she's done is she's found this completely destroyed typewriter from the explosions. But again, what she does is she crops it so that we don't see any of what's around. So you just have this very, very bizarre looking close up of this completely destroyed typewriter. And by removing everything else, it again kind of dislocates it from the reality and clever, she calls it Remington silent. As a Vogue a photographer, she was in a shoot and she shows us these two models wearing right during the blitz, these air raid precautions. And again, it just makes it into a very, very strange scene. Claude Kahn is a woman that was really not um, recognized much until she died. Fascinating artist and writer. She was a young Jewish woman that was very comfortable saying, I'm neither male nor female. I think there's a third sex. She was literally what we now talk about as like um, non-binary. And she created these images of herself. Here's she's using photo montage where she shaved her head. And so there's something very strange about this. Of course, it looks like a creature with two heads. She's very uh, into the idea of duality, into the fact that again, male, female, binary systems and breaking those away. Here she shows herself both sitting and standing and using photo montage kind of, again, duality. Um, she wound up having a partner. Claude is a very gender neutral name. That's not actually her name. Her name's Lucy. Her partner also chose a pseudonym that was gender neutral, Marcel. And they lived together in the island of Jersey for many years. What you're seeing though, is she's an artist that's known for auto portraits. And um, there are artists today like Cindy Sherman and others that talk about her work because again, this is surrealism, but using your own body, dressing up in different ways, um, showing yourself upside down, showing two of yourself. Here she shows us, she's actually in almost like a costume of a rock here she suddenly becomes this little sleeping girl inside a cupboard. And again, this idea of a weird juxtaposition, not the most comfortable place to go to sleep. She was actually, speaking of being anti-fascist and part of the resistance, the Nazis got a hold of her. She was in a Nazi prison for a year, nearly starved to death. When she came out, she gives us this kind of work it's very eerie. She's wearing a mask. She's wearing one black glove. It's this idea again of life and death, duality. And she's near the cemetery that would actually become the place where she would be buried six years later. As I said, uh, some contemporary artists like Gillian Waring have gone there, for instance, and done this kind of homage. Gillian Waring, if you don't know one, is a contemporary artist that does all kinds of things with masks. So this obviously, and, and self-portraits with masks. So this has a tremendous affinity to the work of Claude 
Khan. Maurice Tabar will cover quickly. He was a fashion and, and kind of photographer that really used photo montage brilliantly. Um, talk about juxtaposing two things in a strange way. You've got this eye, this big, big eye sitting in this empty room. So it, it almost speaks to, again, the importance of the eye as being kind of the ultimate sense that perceives reality. But at the same time, that reality, at least here, is this isolated empty room. He did really fun things with photo montage. Uh, he portrays this woman, Wanda Walls, but he overlaps that with a portrait of a cat. So for those of you that are fans of cats, maybe we can um, get you uh, your photograph in photo montage <laughs> with your pet. Um, and this one, which is wonderful, because if you see what he's done is there's this beautiful fashion photograph of a woman in a dress, and then an upside down tree, and he calls it the walking tree. So again, this was very innovative and kind of very avant-garde and of course, very surrealist, it's a walking tree. I love this one, I don't know why, I think aesthetically it's just really beautiful. Uh, he's taken both the Eiffel Tower, but a nude as well. And, and if you think about it, the Eiffel Tower, at the end of the day, is this very strong, phallic, kind of looking object, well, huge tower. And that is overlapped with kind of the softness and the curves and the beauty of this female nude. So I think that, again, sexuality and objects and overlapping and juxtapositions are all very dreamlike and very interesting. Uh, a huge photographer in France, um, potentially even considered the most important or one of them is Henri Cartier-Bresson. While he's not always necessarily considered a surrealist per se part of the movement, certainly uh, in the 30s, uh, he had met and hung out with the surrealists. And um, you'll see in this series of photographs that he took in places like Spain, which by the way, this was just, just pre-Spanish Civil War a couple of years before. Um, I don't know if you know what you're looking at here, and that's what's fun about these is that, again, he's just finding surrealism in nature. And I, for the longest time, had no idea how he did this. What he did, I know my friend uh, Arturo, who's from Spain, probably would guess in a minute. Um, he went inside the bull ring in Valencia. He caught this door with a number seven just at the moment that it's partly open. And that door happens to have a little window and this man is peering through it. And then this other man is back there. And by the way, this is where the bull will come from. So I'm sure he tried to get out of the way soon, but um, it speaks to his use of the Leica camera. This was one of the first cameras you could run around with and really do what he called his decisive moment. It was that idea of capturing things as you see them in an instant. But again, look at the kind of the, the strange dislocation or deconstruction of numbers and objects, the circles now almost, you know, semicircles. And, and his head, of course, looks like it's just floating. Another uh, image from Cartier-Bresson is this image called Madrid. And not only does it exhibit his famous decisive moment because he ca captures the moment that the kid is about to try to get the ball, but look at the strange, strange little rectangular and square windows on this building. So th there's just something about it where, you know, I'm finding surrealism just in a scene like this of children um, playing in Spain. Andre Kertesz was a Hungarian uh, photographer, but spent most of his career, a lot of it in France. And he had gone um, to this suburb of Paris and he had found this particular view very interesting. So he got a friend and they went back and he said, why don't you stand there, hold something. We don't know where you're going. You don't, we don't know who you are or what you're doing. And let's wait for the train to go by. And, and I, I think you'll agree that it's just a very strange kind of weird, what it, it makes it really quite surreal. The fact that the train's going by, this man is 
carrying something. There's also this kind of construction back there. And as I saw this, I would say that I would compare it to Giorgio de Chirico's metaphysical paintings. Um, guess what? You see usually trains going by that often um, suggest the passage of time or the journey of life. And you always or almost always see in the Quirico architectural features in these abandoned plazas that are either aqueducts or um, again, Italian arches. Kirtesh famously took one of those mirrors that we find in amusement parks. So they did have those already in the thirties and he spent four hours photographing nude women, but using these mirrors. And he called these his distortions. And I think you'll agree that there's again, something very, um, well, provocative, strange, bizarre, um, unusual, because again, the bodies are being completely, completely distorted. And, and, and again, this has a lot to do with this whole idea of perception. And, you know, is what you see in surrealism, is what you see really what it is, or is it something else? Um, and I love this one. Some of you may already be thinking what it reminds you of. And it's, I thought, um, even though Munch is usually more of an expressionist, uh, clearly th this, this just, you can't help but to, to think of that, right? Let's talk a little bit about Magritte. Even though he's usually thought of more as a painter, he certainly did photography. Um, he took this photograph of the Belgian equivalent of Andre Breton, who was this gentleman, Nouguet, uh, kind of like the, the leader of, of the Belgium surrealists. And he covers him, or well, asks him to cover himself with a chess set. And interestingly, years later, Magritte, uh, his portrait is taken by uh, another photographer and he covers himself with one of his works. So I thought, well, let's, let's think about that. What, what is that all about? And, and I went back and I looked at the fact that so much Magritte usually is about faces that are covered or hidden and they might be covered by an apple or a dove or in the case of the lovers. <laughs> and, and, you know, he said something that is very surrealist, which is everything we see hides another thing. We always want to see what is hidden by what we see. So again, it's this idea that our eyes, all, all the eyes do is show us kind of the reality that exists outside of us, but there's an entirely other reality, which is again, what surrealism is about. It's a reality uh, above and beyond the one we see. This is really clever because Magritte basically uh, took this image that makes it look like, you know, did he set up a cannon and the cannon's about to shoot someone? And actually that's a very, very major collector, Edward James. He's almost known as the Saatchi of the Surrealists. He was a billionaire, he was very eccentric, and he pretty much, you could say, made Dali and Magritte's career. He became their biggest fans and collectors. And what he's actually done is he's just stood Edward James in next to his painting. So it's really clever in terms of a vantage point because all you're doing is seeing his most major collector in front of the painting. What's funny about this is that Magritte had sent a proposal to James for a really big, big project and kind of a proposal to make more money and James had not um, had rejected it and you do wonder how much of this is his way of saying oh yeah well I'm going to put you in front of my cannon. Okay we're going to start looking at some art that at times can be a little bit creepy. Now we're leaving we're leaving kind of the immediate France as you know we just saw Belgium in, in, uh, in Berlin, Hans Bellmer became famous for a project he called The Doll. Um, Hans Bellmer was a, 
was a young man who had an incredibly abusive father. Both his brother and he were abused terribly by this stern father. Um, and in this project, Hans Belmer is not only a photographer, but he's a sculptor. He creates these dolls out of plaster and wood. And then he takes photographs of them. But what's a little bit eerie is that it's not really the doll fully. It's often the doll in kind of pieces or disassembled or amputated. Um, you could analyze this to death. Some say that Hans Belmer would be like the perfect Freud patient because just talking about these dolls and what he's doing, you could spend years figuring that out. Um, there's preoccupations with young women. There's preoccupations with having seen reports of, of Jack the Ripper. He had also seen the opera, The Tales of Hoffman. In The Tales of Hoffman by Offenbach, um, you know, the protagonist falls in love with an, an automaton. So there's a lot of things happening here. I think the other theory is that Nazi Germany was kind of starting to emerge and this would become what Hitler would decide would be degenerate art. So it was also his way of taking control and maybe even creating art that would be considered against the norm. Again, these are um, strange, creepy, bizarre, uh, because you've got, again, dolls that he's constructed and then deconstructed and then photographed. The British artist Bill Brandt is someone that we talked about in the uh, in the talk about Creatures of the Night, because he had famously photographed um, London, One Night in London, you may remember, it was like, let's look at London at night. This is later in the 50s, but look at what he's done. You know, he became very famous for his nudes. And then he started saying, well, let's look at parts of a nude. And then let's go further and let's, let's look at like parts of people on a beach. I happen to love these. I think there's, there's just something really funny and strange. And so all he's done, if you think about it, it's not that complicated. You're looking at someone's ear laying on a beach here in East Sussex or someone's foot in the beaches of Normandy. But again, it's about lighting, it's about cropping, it's about taking these pieces of a body and completely dislocating them and taking them out of context. So it makes it strange and it makes it funny. So now we're ready to cross the pond. And the way to do that is to acknowledge that Andre Breton, the head of surrealism, went to Mexico. So we're gonna start in Mexico as opposed to the US and there he is with Frida. And you know, Breton famously said I think Mexico is like the surrealist place par excellence. And, and I think I, you heard me last time say that my family, uh, we often said that too, that in Mexico, if you look around, you see a lot of stuff that looks really surreal. Um, it can be funny, it can be just... Um, so, by the way, um, remember that artist Claude Kahn with her duality of like male and female and two Fridas here. Frida did a lot of that. Frida did a lot of like Frida as a man, Frida as a woman, two Fridas. So I thought you would enjoy knowing that, that that was kind of an ongoing theme in surrealism. Manuel Alvarez Bravo is, is wonderful because he is again like Lee Miller. He's finding surrealism in Mexico. He's not setting up, you know, let me put objects together, let me create these scenes. This is just, again, if you look around in Mexico, here's this wonderful image of an advertisement painted on a wall underneath this, this electrical workshop. But of course you just see, you know, the feet, you know, the legs of these, these two people. So uh, it's, it's very strange. And of course he crops it. So you don't even see, you know, you kind of wonder what's above here. This is one of his most famous images. He calls it parabola optical or optic parable. It's essentially a photograph of, of, of an optical store. But of course, eyes uh, are always strange because they're looking at us or we're looking at them. And what he did on purpose, if you notice, is he printed this in reverse. 
So part of the parable is not only we're looking at the optical store, the store is looking at us, but it's actually the other way around. So if you, you know, this is backwards. And I always wondered about that when I had seen this before, I thought, am I just, am I getting the, <laughs> am I getting the right image or what's going on here? Um, I love these. These are much later, just to let you know, they're in the 70s. I actually wrote a paper about this. Imagine this house and imagine the vantage point he gets and these magueyes, these are these huge agrave plants. And there's this strange little window here that's kind of off center. And don't tell me it doesn't look like these plants aren't just like this monstrous creature that's about to kind of engulf the house and whoever lives in it. And again, all he's doing is he's looking and he's cropping and he's maybe waiting for the right moment with shadows, but he's not set this up at all. This is again, part of kind of Mexico's surrealism that's right there for you to look at. And, and this is another wonderful example because he sees this carrizo, which is a type of plant and just kind of this branch, but then a television antenna. And again, it's this funny juxtaposition of the two because one of course is of nature, the other one is not alive, it's technology. And it almost looks as if they're about to get into a big battle. So I think it's wonderful because again, it's about looking and it's about cropping and capturing this strange combination of objects. Now let's move to the US. George Platt Lines is, is not known so much for his surrealism. He's known for being the official photographer of the New York City Ballet. He also did fashion photography, but because of the ballet, um, and he was uh, uh, also known for his new, many, many nudes that he did of dancers and celebrities kind of behind the scenes, because that was something you couldn't do very publicly. But of course he had access to these gorgeous bodies. And this is so clever because it's called a sleepwalker. And normally, of course, a sleepwalker is an entire body walking, sleeping. This instead is, you know, half the body is the walking part and the other is an entire body sleeping above it. I think it's really, really wonderful and clever. You know, he sometimes did a photograph like this, which is, you know, from the birth of Dionysus. You may remember that this is the Greek character that was, the son of Zeus, but born from a, um, you know, his mother wasn't a goddess, his mother was a, a mortal. And so they took Dionysus out of her womb and then made sure that he was kind of born out of this leg here. And the fact that he's just like recreating this myth, but of course, um, you know, when you look at it, it's, it's really, it's, it's like a Greek myth brought, brought to modern times, brought to a photograph of 1939. He um, worked with Dali. Uh, these are these incredible Dali costumes. Uh, they're wonderful because the figures are in these very strange positions, um, propped up by these metal stands. And this one, for instance, this is like a tutu that instead of being around her waist is actually over her head. So they're, they're very mysterious, um, very, very fun. This is, uh, we're now gonna talk about a little bit of the work photographers did with actually Dali himself. So this is a portrait by George Platt Lines of Dali. And what these photographers would try to do is they said, listen, if I'm gonna photograph Dali, well, let's make sure the photograph is kind of surrealistic. So here's Dali holding this nude and the nude is covered by this big lobster. Dali had created a phone just the year before that he called a lobster telephone. And if you look up Dali, uh, it appears that he felt that lobsters and crustaceans were very sexual as well as were phones. So again, these objects have all sorts of sexual connotations to them. One of the most famous photographs of Dali and, 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 and which has gone down in history as one of the most surrealistic photographs is this photograph by Philippe Halsman. Halsman wasn't necessarily a surrealist. So I mean, although it's debatable, he did so many of these that some do say he is a surrealist, but 
the point is that when he became friendly with Dali um, and started collaborating, he thought, you know, again, if I'm going to portray Dali, because he was mostly a portraitist, Halsman, let's do something really special. So this is why you have this image that you say, my God, how, how in the world do you do this? There's Dali suspended in the air, a flying chair, flying cats, water, paintings. Well, let's analyze it. First on the right, they've included a painting that Dali had made called Leda Atomica. Leda Atomica, um, this refers to the, the story again of, of Leda and the swan. Uh, they actually in mythology had sex, but um, this is Gala. He's used Gala, his wife, as the model for Leda. And they're suspended in the air. And part of this atomica is because, you know, the big nuclear bombs have been thrown, had been used. And there was this whole idea that atoms don't touch each other and things kind of get suspended in the air. So this whole idea of like things in suspension. So first of all, it's kind of an homage to this painting. But the other thing is that Halsman was known for a very famous series that he would publish called Jumpology. His idea was, if I wanna do portraits and really get to people's personality, I think it's best that I get them when they're jumping. So the reason Salvador Dali is up in the air and jumping is because Halsman spent years taking photographs of people, whether it's Anthony Perkins or Audrey Hepburn, there's even one of Nixon and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And the idea is when people jump, they're childlike, I see their real personality. By the way, it took, what is it, uh, over six hours to, to, to get this. And it also took about 30 different attempts. This is really fun because this shows you all the times that it didn't work. In this one, they show water splashes Dali instead of the cat. This one, J Dali jumps too late. Water covers Dali's face. By the way, the poor cats, for those of you that are cat lovers, this really was about throwing cats. I, I would venture to say that now in 2021, this would be highly condemned. Um, but believe it or not, Dali initially wanted to explode a duck. So throwing, throwing cats was considered maybe a little bit better than exploding a duck. Another example of this wonderful collaboration, first we have the images of kind of the process. Halsman has photographed Dali with this group of ladies completely in the nude. And he seems to be like a ringmaster organizing them and kind of getting them set up. And what he does, again, this took hours, is to create what's called almost Dali's skull. It's really, really creative and clever. It's like, how do you create a skull's head with women's nudes? And that wound up becoming in voluptas mors or voluptuous death. And the last thing I'll mention about their collaboration is, you know, Dali is famous for his mustache. Um, I understand a few years ago when they had to exhume Dali's body, you know, there was a woman claiming she was probably his daughter and wanted part of the estate they literally went and undug Dali. And I know this sounds kind of gross, but his mustache was still huge uh, years later. But the point is that Halsman and Dali published a book that showed Dali's mustache in over 30 different postures. So it's again, very surreal and very fun because again, if you first look at that, you wonder what, it, and he calls it clever things like Dali as seen by his psychoanalyst. Okay, I think we're actually doing okay. We're moving uh, now to the American South. This is a really interesting artist because he was working in the 40s and he, he's from New Orleans. And he was first and foremost, someone really involved with like architectural preservation of the antebellum mansions and plantations. But he winds up 
saying, I'm going to photograph all these mansions and plantations and stuff because in a way, this is about preserving, you know, these are, these were most, many of them are abandoned and they are um, really about kind of a piece of history that's gone. And the book wound up being called The Ghosts Along the Mississippi. But to make the photographs more interesting, you know, a mansion is a mansion, but it becomes more interesting if I use photo montage and I use this soft focus that makes it blurry and I put one upside down and then the other one straight and I call it Elegy for Mossland. He was almost considered like an Edgar Allan Poe, but with a camera. So this becomes almost about like the ghosts of antebellum and the people that live there and these abandoned mansions. And by the way, he did use people and props and um, to make, to create these kind of very ghastly images. So, I mean, you've got this woman in, in a black dress holding up what looks almost as if it would have been a memento about, of someone. In this one, it's this kind of strange, it's part woman, part doll. So again, it speaks to this kind of duality, you know, what is real and what isn't. And he calls it the masks grows to us. So I just want you to see that because uh, it's pretty extensive work. It's about a hundred photographs. And I think they take surrealism into this realm more of almost like the spiritual and the ghostly. Speaking of the American South, some of you may know the work of Ralph Eugene Meatyard. He's considered an amazing photographer. It, it can be a bit disturbing because he uses a lot of masks, a lot of dolls. And of course you've got, this is by the way in Kentucky, he finds family, his own kids, neighbors, and he puts them in masks or has them, you know, hold dolls inside abandoned farms and stuff. It creates um, a, a very unusual kind of disquieting feeling. Um, and he even calls this one surreal. Um, and again, it's, it's the child, it's the masks, there's pieces of mannequins. Um, and again, this is not about finding surrealism in nature, this is about creating scenes that are very surrealistic. This one actually um, reminds me of, of, of James Ensor. Some of you may know a Belgian artist. He's not that well known, but he did some fairly creepy disquieting uh, paintings of masks. Um, his were more for more of a political purpose usually, and also having looked at carnivals locally in Belgium, but I couldn't help but to to think of that. I mean, this stuff can give you nightmares, again, because the masks are quite unattractive. And, you know, children have a great, great, um, children love fantasy and, 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 you know, they love Halloween and all, but it, it's still, it's, it's still a, an interesting combination of children with ugly masks. Um, Francesca Woodman was a young woman that was the daughter of two people very involved in the art world. Um, she spent time at the Rhode Island School of Design and she also spent time in Italy. And what she started doing, and this again takes us back to Claude Kahn, self-portraits of, you know, I'm gonna include myself in these images where I'm in Again, buildings that look abandoned, there's broken pieces everywhere. I'm using go long exposure, so I look kind of ghost-like. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, this is about memory. This is about how we remember things only vaguely. This is about maybe life and death. It, it's, it's complex. Sometimes she looks at the theme of angels um, these are these items she's put up that look like wings and she sometimes is jumping or in midair naked. Here she again shows herself naked next to an eel. This may have some very sexual undertones to it. This one is 
really kind of creepy because it looks, of course, like a crucifixion. So she's managed to take herself kind of hanging from this, this door. And I am afraid to say that at the age of 22, you know, she was someone that was known for being very competitive with herself, was not feeling like she was getting the recognition she deserved yet. And she actually took her life. She jumped at the age of 22 from a balcony here on the east side of New York. She was mostly discovered after her death and is now considered an incredibly important photographer and artist. So now we're gonna go super creepy and then we'll bring you back to uncreepy. So I don't want you to go to sleep with this. Joel Peter Witkin, probably one of the most controversial artists out there because he, his way of showing us surrealism is say, you know, I'm not gonna use tricks and photo montage. I'm actually gonna find in this case, people that have some disabilities. Um, so here's portrait of a dwarf Here's a woman on a table. The woman is obviously missing her legs. Some have said this is outrageous. It's exploitative. Um, others love it. Um, looks like an episode of American Horror Story, if any of you are fans of that. To me, some of this reminds me, I think he's kind of channeling or looking at some of those photographs from the Victorian era that were about, you know, the woman with two heads. Again, American Horror Story, the little woman. This one's fascinating because of course he's referencing the, the famous Man Ray that we talked about. And the most controversial thing is that he finds actual parts of cadavers. So I, I promise you we'll, we'll end with happier things. But, and by the way, sorry, he does it in Mexico. The laws were more lax there. So he creates these still lifes and that is actually an arm. That is not a mannequin. That is someone's actual foot. So they're, they're pretty brutal. They're pretty horrific. Um, they're also in a way very effective if you want to look at, you know, creepy gothic kind of things out of nightmares. So now let's talk about color photography. I know we only have a few minutes left. We're almost done. And this, 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 this gets a little bit more upbeat and more happy. Sammy Skoglund is a remarkable artist because this is not Photoshopped. Sammy Skoglund creates, she made all these cats with wire and plaster. She painted all of them. She creates an entire set and she calls it, and then she calls these neighbors and says, come in, I wanna take your picture. So she calls it radioactive cats. And usually there are these very large prints, they're very monochromatic. So here it's very much about the greens, but she's also done the revenge of the goldfish or she's done fox games. And again, think of the work Talk about not just bumping into surrealism on the street. This is about creating sets. I thought this was hilarious. I hadn't seen this one. It's called a cocktail party. She created an entire set made out of cheese doodles. And you're not gonna believe it. If you go to San Antonio, I don't know how they make sure mice don't get there, but that is the set for the cocktail party. You can actually, so if you don't believe that this was, was in Photoshop, there is the actual cocktail party in San Antonio. Irving Penn, one of the most famous photographers of the 20th century in the US, fashion photographer for Vogue. Um, he really dumb it, you know, knew how to use color and started looking again at this idea of let's just concentrate on parts of people and really close ups and kind of dislocation. He's got this wonderful eye looking through a keyhole. And I think to him, that's almost a, a reminder that as a photographer, that is what you do. You look through a camera. Remarkable stuff. And again, for fashion magazines, this was like, wow, this guy's amazing because you know he's gonna give me the L'Oreal ad where the lips are completely smudged in all these colors. 
But again, you could say this is very surrealistic because the lips are in complete isolation and look at what's happened to these lips. And then these lips have a B on them. And these, which again, he calls almost like still lives, they are, but they're very different. Uh, he actually has drawn these out in advance and um, he's given us here cheese, but you see it's melted. So it's a little bit, a little bit gross, a little bit like, I don't wanna eat that. And it has an ant on it. This one he calls aphrodisiacs. It's an oyster, money, a pill. So a lot of things that are, well, either desirable or maybe addictive. And again, an insect there. I was, I don't know, I don't think he was thinking of this, but it reminded me of this famous surrealistic painting because in the persistence of memory by Dali, not only do you have melting clocks as you have melting cheese, but you do have actually ants, which often appear even in Buñuel's Ancien Andalou. So finally, we're gonna close with the idea that surrealism is alive and well around the world. So these are much younger artists, but I, I'm now gonna show you that they're working today in a very surrealistic way and all around the world. So here's Tommy Ingberg, Sweden, and you can see that he loves Magritte. So the, the references to the Magritte with the hat and the umbrellas are very, very clear. Ronan Goldman out of Tel Aviv. Again, some really interesting Magritte referencing there. These flying, he calls it identity crisis. I like this, my groove is back from long vacation. <laughs> and this guy's like surfing, surfing in a road. Some artists I would argue are using surrealism with a little bit of a purpose. So Amina Bembuchta is a Moroccan woman that is very involved with gender identity and some of the issues of women in the Middle East. So here, this woman's head is covered by a, an apple. Remember, that's very Magritte. But here, she's covered also with something else. And this has to do in a way more about censorship. So she's almost taken the surrealist idea of you can't see the face, but here it might have this, you know, this is about gender, this is about women's rights, this is about women's censorship. Lara Sankul from Lebanon, I love these. You're not gonna believe this, this is not Photoshop. She creates a set, she fills it with water. And what she shows us is that what you see above the water may not be the reality. These friends look like they're having a lovely time, but underneath it all, she's cutting into her. This man looks like this nice masculine gentleman. There's a feminine side to him that you may not see when you see him in his little, what almost looks like a waiter costume. Karen Knorr, I love these. She takes us, she talk about dislocating. Let me put zebras in a house. Or let me put these gorgeous um, peacocks inside another beautiful architectural space. They're really beautiful and again, very surreal. Czech Republic, Martin Stranka is one of the names you see the most. Um, I won't talk about both, but here, look at this. It's very clever. It's, it's called Bloom For You, I Bloom For You. And this car just like flowers are just pouring out of it. That's someone you wanna go on a date with. Well, maybe not. Um, you need a place to sit. So in closing thoughts, um, let's talk for a minute about the actual subject matter. You know, what were we looking at? And, and again, I wanted to make the point that some photographers are just finding surrealism out there in the world. So Henri Cartier-Bresson found it in a bull ring. Um, Manuel Alvarez Bravo was seeing it in this house. Um, Lee Miller saw it from the inside of a tent. They didn't go and construct anything. Others go and construct still lifes with parts of dead bodies or children with masks or plaster cats. 
What about some of the motifs we saw? Well, you see, the reason you see so many eyes is because in surrealism, the eye is believed to be almost like the key sense, visual, the visual uh, sense is almost the key to our perception of external reality. But there's this whole idea that what you're seeing is simply not the real inner truth. We saw a lot of these frequent hidden faces. And again, it has to do with, I mean, Magritte actually said a portrait of a person doesn't say anything about the person because their face is in their reality. So it's almost like saying, you, might, you, you don't really see me. You really don't, you don't see the reality. Dislocated body parts come up a lot. And again, this has a lot to do with Freud. It has a lot to do with these body parts and surrealism often meaning different things. And they're often grotesque. They're often about sexual kinds of desires and urges. Um, but again, they're often dislocated. They're broken away from the body. And the last slide, um, just to make the point that surrealists really do make tons of important choices uh, in, in photography. So, you know, if you look back at this, this was about vantage point. Uh, this was about where he placed the collector. You know, these rats, if she had taken them from the front or from above, not so interesting. If you look at their little rats booties from below and with this lighting and in isolation of everything that matters same with the typewriter it's just the typewriter sitting you know outside of the context of the london blitz um and again photo montage long exposures so it's all of the ways it's what are we looking at but then how was it shot and how is it manipulated so again i hope you saw that Photography really did catch up in being very avant-garde in reflecting kind of the, the ideals of surrealism and that it's alive and well today. So with that, um, I, I was actually, um, yikes. Oh, I was gonna say one last thing, sorry. Um, this is just my little pitch. If you enjoyed this talk, spread the word because the more the merrier, I'd love to. I know some folks tonight had heard from others. And so I love seeing you here. If you use Yelp, uh, I would love for you to write a review on there. And then last thing, I have a little GoFundMe page. If you go there and you look at promote art education, support, look at New York art, you can read about what I'm trying to do. I'll remind you by email on all these things. So with that, I will now stop sharing. And I'm so glad that many of you could still be here. I see 40 of you still here. So now to do this, if you, um, if you raise your hand, I'll unmute you and we can start the discussion like that because um, I sometimes have trouble unmuting absolutely everyone at once. Let me look at the chat for a minute. Oh, okay. Okay, no, okay. So show me your hands and I will. I don't see any hands up. Oh, Alexandra, let's see. I'm asking you to unmute. Hola, friend. Hola, Alex. Well, thank you so much for, for the presentation. And so always, you're incredible. Oh. And I love you so much. Oh. We studied together so uh, at Christy. So, and he was always one of the best presenters as well. So I couldn't miss it. Thank you. And um, I have a question. I'm very curious about the Southern photographers because uh, I'm not too familiar with Southern culture, but when you watch movies and scary movies, they always make reference of voodoo and things like that and African culture and influence and maybe from the Caribbean. So I'm just wondering when they put these weird, I mean, you look at surrealism, but what element comes from foreign culture and belief or voodoo and things like that do they actually mention those how they were influenced maybe if they were if any you know what it's an interesting question i need to uh in what i've read about lachlan you know who was doing kind of the antebellum architecture i didn't see any mention of that although since he is from new orleans uh, i would be interesting to follow up and i'll research whether you know new orleans is known for that um, connection to 
the Creole culture and French and all that. So let me see mm -hmm. if there's anything about that. I'll, I'll make a note of it. Because you look at amputated legs and things like that. And, and I think about, unfortunately, that's happening right now in Venezuela, where I come from, um, that you have this black magic, or I don't know the terminology for that from Creole or from different things like that. And, and, and um, they use remnants of animals. So mm -hmm. I don't know why it had a feeling like these photos had a feeling of kind of looking into that. And I cannot help but think but Dutch paintings when you have still life and you have remnants of, uh, of uh, prey and, and um, the skull, maybe Memento Mori, but taken today to a, or maybe to a surre surrealist connotation. Okay, thank you, Alex. I'm gonna look into that with the Southern artists. Anyone else? Any, uh, let me see if I see any other hands. Oh, God. Oh, I see uh, Sandy. Let me see. I've asked you to unmute. Yeah. I'm just trying to come to terms with the differences between the work that was done in the dark room versus what people are mm -hmm. doing today with Photoshop. The darkroom work seems to lend itself to artistic and the Photoshop seems to be lending itself to a better photograph, if you will. Mm. And to, it seems almost too perfect. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Uh, Sandy always asks about the photographs themselves because he's a photographer. So he's the one that sometimes stumps me a little bit. But yeah, when you look at these artists, they really are working kind of like what, what we call analog photography, right? So it's all about actual mechanical, you know, it's what can I do with these negatives? What can I do with more or less light in the dark room and so on? But there really is no digital manipulation. Um, but it is, so, so there are limitations to what they could do. I, I almost think that what we saw today were a lot of artists that were taking the medium almost as far as they could. You know, they were trying like absolutely anything they could do. Could they uh, get photo montage? What, so this was all very experimental. Um, I mean now, but, but I do find it interesting that even these contemporary artists that I talked about are creating their own sets. I, I almost wonder if there's a little bit of more respect to like, you actually created this and photographed it and it's not just digital manipulation. Um, not to say that there are artists that do amazing work with digital, um, but I think it is maybe a little bit perceived as like, well, that's mostly about working on the computer. Um, it's not like you, created a whole set with cats on it or put people underwater in a set. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Oh, it, it answers the question, but I, when I'm talking to people that say I'm a photographer, they're dealing almost exclusively with cropping and light, nothing more. Right. Uh, and their image, of course. Whereas when you talk to an artist, there's frequently a message associated with what they're doing and a lot more in-depth thinking that went behind what they did. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else? I, I realize we're, we're now past seven. Let me just uh, make sure I'm seeing everyone here. Uh, oh, Darren, let's see. <laughs> I'm asking you to unmute. I didn't see. Uh, Okay. Hi, this was so fabulous. Oh, thank, thank you, you for putting so much work into it. Um, it's especially remarkable how, um, how quick you are, because I remember taking art history, and they linger over the images in a way that sometimes is a little, uh, it sort of lulls you a little bit. <laughs> and this was just, I was on the edge of my seat. So thank you for oh, that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I will confess what I often debate about is whether I should have as many artists and as many images, because I do go boom, 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 boom. So it's a lot of stuff. I wonder sometimes if it should be less, you know, more talk of less. But so your feedback is, is useful, though, that at least it doesn't drag on. So. Oh, yeah, no, it was great. And especially 
you know, the, the, um, the range of work that you covered was amazing. Oh, good. Um, I was just wondering if in, in this talk and in the talk you did, the last one on surrealism, whether there was a piece of it that was sort of queer or seemed queer to you, because it's always something, a question I've struggled with. Mm -hmm. um, I was always sort of drawn to surrealism and the, and the way in which surrealism rethinks and sees reality in, in ways that are fundamentally subversive yeah. and counter normative in really deep ways. Yes. And so there is something so queer about it all. And then at the same time, you know, of course, at least the French surrealists were so um, sexist and, and, and straight in many ways yeah. and, and almost like a little, you know, an old boys club. Um, so I was just wondering whether, you know, not obviously just as a sort of a little side issue, whether you had yeah. observed any of that in your review for this work. Uh, I think it's a great question. I will tell you that from the research I did for this, the one that was kind of most refreshing as far as that or surprising was Claude Kahn. Uh, I, I know I don't pronounce her last name well, but it's God. Um, she really was, you know, openly gay, had a partner, uh, really question, I can send you her quotes are amazing. She basically yeah. says, um, I'm neither masculine nor feminine, I'm neuter. I'm like, I'm in the middle. So she really is kind of the anti-heteronormative, yeah. like out there talking about that. Um, with, with the other research, I mostly bumped into things like Surrealist reading the Marquis de Sade and loving like ideas of like submission and domination mm. and women being, you know, so it not necessarily queer, as you said, mm. so, but, I, but I think it's an interesting topic to look into more because I have mm. a feeling there's more there and I wasn't looking for it enough in this particular talk. So or there might not be more there. I mean, it might be that as a genre, it's right. still defined by that kind of masculinity and and Kaha is sort of like you know, exceptional in that way. Right. Um, but yeah, I saw there was a, a, a retrospective of her work at the Orangerie mm. that we happened to catch. And it oh, was wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Ah, Tonya. Let's see. Ask to unmute. I'm asking you to unmute. I think you have to unmute yourself. Ah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Well, a friend. Yes? Yes. Well, I want to thank you and congratulate you for this very good presentation because you know surrealism is a very profound movement very, very hard and very rich. And you flow with us, you know, in your, in your beautiful and interesting presentation of all these artists. I knew very little about photography. Mm -hmm. I knew a little bit more about painting, surrealistic, because you know, in Mexico is very popular, this movement. Yeah. But uh, I discovered, thanks to you, a lot of in photography. I will be more curious now on to go deeper on the the artist that you present. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you from so Mexico much. City. Goodbye so to everybody. So glad you joined from Mexico City. Anyone else? Uh, let me just go to the chat really quickly. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, regarding my next talk, that is a great question. I have to admit that I, uh, at one point I was on a roll and I was like, okay, here's another one and here's another one and here's another one. And then at some point I was like, oh my God, I need a break. And then I did these two on surrealism, but stay tuned because 
this this is uh i i see it's it people enjoy it they're learning a lot so this is exactly why i want to expand this and go further but so i will let you know and by the way if you have ideas of of just topics that you know you think could be interesting to look at in the whole world of art photography those are very welcome um because again for those of you that don't know i did a talk on women photographers i did one that was about art photography of children there was one about well i did three on contemporary photography of you know more recent people working uh, so really there's all kinds of topics there's topics about you know 19th century photography and what that was all about uh really there, there's so many directions and i will put karen on the mailing list and thank you again i know it's we're a little bit late now so uh oh agustin if you need to go i will not be offended those of us that want to stay i'll just continue to get your questions let's see agustin where are you um can you see me efren yes i can how are you good it was great to see you thank you so much i really enjoyed it um, so I, I, I feel like I don't have a concise question because I'm processing a lot of the ideas that were presented. And I, I actually really love the fact that it was such an overview. And, um, you know, I appreciated, I didn't know about Francesca Woodman's art. Mm. Um, and, you know, that was, and I, I loved hearing what you um, said about Claude. Uh, how do you say her, their last name, her last name? Well, when I saw it said by someone on video, a French man, he said, Cahun. Cahun. Uh, it's almost like, because I was like, Cahun, Cahun. It's like, it's like, Cahun. It's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. We'll yeah. have to practice on that together. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to hear it several times. So, yeah. So the thing that I was, I'm just sort of interested in the way that I've been thinking about the dislocated body parts. Yes. You know, you see in different, um, like I'm thinking of Otto Dix, there's a painting that he did that uh, is a woman and she's like headless. And so, you know, I'm thinking there's like um, some modern musicians um, that have songs about dislocated body parts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Or even movies, there's plenty of dislocated body, body parts. Yeah. It's sort of interesting just to think about surrealism and the way you, you ended by focusing on like the modern day application of it and I really loved that. Um, oh, thank you. The one qu question that I had was whether or not um, you had any, uh, if you had a list of the works that you referenced or if it was possible to see your slides. I don't know if you'd be comfortable sharing that. Yeah, you know what, I think I could probably create like a little PDF that has um, sometimes even like a handout that has little mini versions of it or a list and send it out. I'd be happy to, um, because yeah, that's, they used to do that at our lectures at Christie's, you know, here's kind of the list of what we showed or, so yeah, yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Wonderful, thanks Efren. Uh, for everyone, August, August, Augustine, I call him Agustin, but he goes by Augustine is actually, he teaches film. So I knew that this would be interesting because there are certainly a lot of surrealistic films and uh, hopefully you learn something. <laughs> From and my college students love Ancien Andalou. It's kind of great. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> um, talk about eyes having important roles in movies. Um, but I appreciated you did you did sort of like these moments of warning people when something was coming up that might <laughs> which I thought was really skillful. So thank you. <laughs> oh, good, good. Ah. I'm asking Helene to unmute. Ah, oh, there you go. Hi, well, you were thinking, you were um, asking for some ideas. I mean, I enjoyed this just as I've enjoyed every one of these presentations. And um, I was just wondering, I, I don't know if there's enough material about it, but you know that so many, um, there are so many fam famous fashion photographers and even in the Vogue's that I'm receiving now through a subscription, um, the type of photography and the montage and all has become much more symbolic than it 
it had been at one point yeah. and I wondered if if there's enough you know if there's enough material to do a one of these sessions oh, about fashion photography uh, absolutely absolutely I think um you know what's what's interesting about a lot of these artists that were basically in the art world is that to make to be able to pay their rent, they couldn't just be artists. They had to be commercial artists as well. So a lot of the people we talked about today worked at Harper's Bazaar, worked at Vogue, worked at Life Magazine. And so in fact, and they were often bringing, in this case, their surrealism into those realms, whether it's fashion and otherwise. So yeah, looking at kind of the history of fashion photography, and how it's evolved and how it's been influenced by the artistic movements is definitely, I think there's absolutely so much there. So that would be oh. a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other final thoughts? And if not, I'll, we'll just go to the chat here. Uh, all right. Well, thanks again um, uh, for, for attending. And please do write to me uh, if you're not on my mailing list because I would hate to lose you if you wanna see more and I just don't know how to reach you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and I'll make sure that the next one isn't too far away. I promise you that because I, I don't want you to go, oh, those things aren't happening anymore. <laughs> okay, so I, I wish you a, a great night and um, thanks again for your support. Bye. Bye.